Let's all take our hymn books this morning and turn to page 133. Let's all stand as we sing. I, I'm hoping that you're all going to know this song, and everybody's just going to sing right out. It, <laughs> it's called uh, The Rock That Is Higher Than I. So we'll, we'll kind of see. <laughs> morning. It's good to see everybody here today. I did not know that hymn, but I did enjoy it. I liked it, and I liked the words, so hopefully we'll add that to the uh, rotation. Did. You did? I did. Okay. <laughs> well, you can see which generation knew it and which generation didn't, so it's been a while since we've done it, I think, in this church, but still, it's good to know. Uh, we need to break out of our comfort zone every once in a while and do things. I mean, there's a hundred hymns in there we've never done in this church, probably, so... Uh, I've tried to do that in the past and flip through them and play through. I said, oh, this is a good one. They're like, mm, we don't know that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, midway through January of 2024, and I've almost figured out or remembered to write 24 on all my dates when I sign something or uh, write a date. So uh, well on our way for that. I hope everybody's had a good week. Um, I did want to say uh, real quick, I feel like uh, you know, God sometimes talks to you d different ways, and in the Sunday school lesson, Julie was talking about uh, paying attention to the signs. So last Sunday, I taught a lesson on wisdom, and then this Sunday, Julie taught about the wise men, and um, one of the things I do at the beginning of Sunday school class is I do hangman, and I'll do a phrase or a saying or something and had the kids try to guess it, and uh, so the one I did was wise men still seek him. And uh, so the lesson was on wisdom. We were talking about how a lot of times wisdom is not intelligence, it's not knowledge, but it comes from experience. And so um, I'm going to pray for us when we pray for discernment. Uh, it's a fancy word that just means you 
realize when God's talking to you and you understand what he's saying. So I think that's important for us to pray for and for wisdom. Wisdom comes from experience, and I think one of the ways you experience God is by reading his word, which is something I need to do more of. I'll just go ahead and say for myself that's something I need to work on. But um, if you're in the word and you read the Bible, you will often receive uh, words from God and messages from God uh, leading. Uh, and then the situations that are in the Bible are amazingly situations that are very similar to things that we all go through today. Uh, people haven't changed that much in 2,000 years. So um, just encourage you to do that. And now to start our service, uh, we, there's announcements in the bulletin. If you don't get a bulletin, uh, we have folks that put these together and have good announcements. And uh, there's also a, uh, an email list. If you're not on it, I'm not sure who to talk to to get on that. Susan? Okay. So see Susan Thomas to get on the email list because that's, that's more handy for me actually than the bulletin because I look at email a lot during the week. But take a look at your bulletin and see the announcements that are in there. Um, I think everything's in there that's supposed to be in there, but if, are there any announcements that aren't in the bulletin or that anybody wants to bring special attention to? Kevin? Yes. Um, the Christian Education Committee is preparing for Love Sunday, which is in your bulletin, um, but we just wanted to um, let you know that we are doing a couple of things in addition to what we normally do. Um, make sure you're on the lookout for the children's list for the Valentine bags, that's normal. Um, but we also are doing two other things. Um, one is we're going to have candy grams for um, youth to adults. And so um, um, you'll get some information um, via email or in a bulletin insert next week. But we just wanted you to be on the lookout for that. And all the donations from that will be given to the renovation fund. Um, so it's like a win-win. You get to share love and help the renovation fund. <coughs> We also, for our program, um, are putting together, uh, part of our program, a short video about love. And so um, you may find that someone comes up to you and asks you a question, and I'm going to give you these three questions so that you can ponder on them before we come, um, because we may video you. The questions are about love. Who at Southport makes you feel loved? How do you know that God loves you? And what do you love about Southport? You won't be, be pressured if you don't want to participate. You don't have to, but we would love to get a wide variety of ages and genders and just different experiences in our church to put together this video that we can share on Love Sunday and then also share it at later times, add it to our website, so maybe it will encourage people to join our church family, which we all love. Read through those one more time. Yes, one more time. Who in Southport makes you feel loved? How do you know that God loves you? And what do you love about Southport? You only have to answer one if you want to. Thanks, Angie. Are there any other announcements? Okay, so the youth is having their soup fundraiser, and that is in the bulletin, the youth group soup and sandwich fundraiser. Um, so Megan's saying, you, you said there is a sign-up sheet in the back. If you want to provide some uh, soup or, uh, I guess, some sandwich items, or I'm not sure how it works, but it, it's probably clear on the paper. If you want to help out with that, just uh, check out the sign-up sheet or uh, find Megan. Are there any other announcements? If not, what we usually do now is um, talk about uh, or go into a time of um, prayer requests and praises. And we had some from the adult Sunday school class, and I'm going to just read these names out to you. Pauline Andrew, Gary Davis, Nancy Lou Murkison, Jeanette Hadley, uh, Joanne Lindley, who's my aunt, is uh, she's moving from her... Um, rehabilitation facility to an assisted living place called Springview on Tuesday. So remember her. Polly Harris, Kiana Craven, and the Laura Whitaker family. Are there any others that you'd like to mention before we go into a time of prayer for our service? 
Yes. My mom, Doris Brady, is having surgery, back surgery Wednesday, so I appreciate prayers for her. Okay. Angie's mother, Doris Brady, is having back surgery on Wednesday. So please <laughs> lift her up. Yes, AJ. Thanks, AJ. So remember the, the troops and uh, praise for blessings. Thank you. Paul Wiley. Paul Wiley. Okay, for his for his cancer. Okay, thank you. If there's no others, let's stand if you're able, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer to start our service. Lord, we lift you up today and uh, thank you for the many blessings in our lives, those that we see and those that we don't always pay attention to. Um, help us to see those. Help us to turn to you as with these prayer requests to um, believe that you are working in our lives and will work with these people's lives and address the, all the different needs that they have. You know what they are. And uh, if it's a health need or if it's an emotional need, help those who are around them as well. Care for them and provide strength and comfort. To help them to be your hands here on earth. And we pray now for our service and for our time together. We pray for discernment here in our service, in the messages that are, are brought and the scriptures that are read. Uh, pray that you would open up our eyes to how that applies to our lives and how we can use that going forward in serving you out in the world and be good servants to you. Uh, spread your word and um, just encourage others to follow you. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books out again. This one will be much better. <laughs> it's page 283. There is a name I love to hear. Page 283. There is a name I love.
I want to have a reading in just a minute, and usually I read a piece of scripture, but I found a prayer written by John Wesley that I thought would be uh, interesting to read this morning and uh, something a little bit different, so I want to read that in a minute. But before that, I wanted to recognize a first-time visitor, somebody who is not even a visitor, but the first time they're here, they're already a member, and so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but today is, I think, Kennedy Lauren Silva's first day with us, and so I just wanted to say... that your church family welcomes you to this world and to this church, and we're so glad to have her here today. And so we're excited about that every time. I, I try to do that when I know this first time, but I don't know if I always do it, but I love doing that. So, And by the way, they said, uh, you know, Kennedy's here, and I said, well, I knew that. I, I went went to her house and got to hold her for an hour and a half, and I have pictures to prove that. So uh, it take you all a while to catch up to me. I'm an hour and a half in on the, on the baby front. Uh, humble brag right there. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is we were talking about learning new music. Somebody came up to me one time and said, Pastor, why don't you, uh, why don't you start preaching in January one year and just see how far you get? And I said, okay. Uh, they were picking out hymns at the time. I said, why don't we start singing the hymnal on number one and see how far we get? <laughs> and they said, well, that, that's not how that works because there's different themes and all that. And I said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> now we both have answers. <laughs> but this is a wonderful prayer by John Wesley that I thought it would be appropriate for today. And it is written in Old English, so to me that it would take a little bit longer for it to sink in, so I'll try to read it slowly. He says, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing or put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or lay aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. That is a powerful prayer. Goodness. And this is the closing for the prayer and I love how he sums it up. Oh, and now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. I often think some prayers are a little harder to pray than others. This one, if you meant it, that'd be rough. Do we have enough faith to offer that to God? We're going to enjoy a special from the choir next.
take some time to settle in, I guess, and the kids are gone and we get to settle in and think about God. I wonder what it would take in the next minute or two if we have some quiet reflection just to turn our hearts and our attention to God and to what he might say. Of course, always, if you feel led to share something that God has placed on your heart, we invite you to do that. I've been reading quite a bit of uh, books lately and, and finding different books to read. I decided on one that was by a motivational speaker who made his, uh, actually made his way in sales. And he was telling a great story. And I thought it was interesting and I share it today. But uh, he said, it was Zig Ziglar. He used to be a salesman and a motivational speaker. And, and, but he said he found some parents sitting out in the audience one day. And they decided to take some of his techniques on motivating people and, and on closing sales and all of that and apply it to uh, parenting. So you could see if, if this applies to you, and I would love to talk to some people who have a three or four year old after this is over and see if you want to try those and if these techniques work. But they said sometimes instead of telling somebody what to do, they don't like to be told what to do, they like to have options. Kids are that way, right? You tell them what to do, what do they do? Say no, stomp their foot, walk off. Maybe, maybe those are options. Maybe they don't all apply at the same time, right? But we don't like to be told. And I often think about, you know, when God tells us what to do, he told Adam and Eve, and they basically said, no, don't worry about it. But the parents decided that instead of telling the little girl, she was, her name is Danielle in the story, and she was three, maybe four years old, that they would give her options. So this is the story as it goes. Instead of saying, it's time to clean up, and we're going to put all your toys in your room, uh, go do it now, which she would often say no, and then they would all get frustrated, and it was not well, happy times at the house, right? They, they decided they'd give her two choices. You have a car here. Would you like to carry it back to your room? Or would you like to push it back to your room? And she thought about it. And she thought, I want to push it back to my room. And so she pushed her car all the way back to her room. And I thought, winner, winner. What is going on here? Is this a, is this a life hack? And, and so they gave her options. And they, so they started doing this. And they, they, everybody was happy at night. And she was doing the things. All they did was give her options but they were options all in the direction of what they wanted. And they said uh, they were kind of wondering not only what was happening and if this was something that would work later, but they also realized 
that the daughter figured out that she could make this work with a younger brother. He must have been one or two, right? And so um, he grabbed her Barbie, right? You can feel the tension building. Because what, what, what might happen if one or two-year-old son gets the Barbie from three-year-old or four-year-old daughter? It could be a knockdown drag out. This could be the end of the evening. This could be everybody went to their room that night, including the parents unhappy, right? And so yeah, they were listening in the other room and they thought, how's she going to handle this? And said, the daughter walked over to the little boy and she says, uh, Michael, that was his name in the, in the story, right? Would you like to hand me that Barbie or would you like to put it on the bed? And Michael put it on the bed and life was great. And I thought, Oh my goodness, we have options. How many of y'all want to try that? Terrible twos no more. You just give options in the right direction. I know, so I saw some spouses like, yeah, I'm trying that out when I get home. <laughs> Honey, would you like to make me a turkey sandwich or a ham sandwich today? <laughs> this is wonderful. All I did was read a book and it was this great idea and all of a sudden it's, you know, what a win, right? <laughs> and so, you know, but I thought in life, don't we have options? And the options are not always as much as we might think they are because we can't affect everything that happens in our life, but one of the great choices that we have is how do we react to the things that happen in our life? And it really is at some point in life, we can, we're living the life we're living, right? And we can choose either to be happy with that life or to not be happy with that life. We can choose either to let that life you know, cause us endless turmoil and grief and complaining and all of those things, or we can say, you know what, this is the life I'm going to look at it. I'm going to see what God can do through this life. And I'm, but I'm going to use it in a way that God is God honoring. Or I can, I can actually say, you know what? God must be done with me if I'm living this life. So bad things happen to me. And maybe I let it push me away from, from that. So the story we started telling last Sunday was there's a, a remarkable connection in the Bible between the story of God, His story, and our story, and what I mean by that is from the beginning to the end, and last week we said from Abraham all the way to Paul, the people in the Bible thought that their story was in some way a reflection of God's story. Abraham was to receive a blessing from God so that he could send that blessing to others. The story of blessing, and we'll follow that in just a minute in the life of Jacob, was one of God blessing us so that he could bless others around us. The story in Paul, Paul said, you know, I received grace from God. The, the, the story of God is redemption and God redeemed me. And my life from here on is to display the story of God. So God's story is told by how we live our story. And I think God's story is better told by how we react to our story and whether we let our story drag us down, right? Because there's difficult parts or whether we look at it in a different way. And we talked about last week, there was a book I read, and one of the great uh, definitions of a storytelling was the elements of a compelling story. And it was where you start with a character, you have a goal, but then there's always a challenge or obstacle. There's always drama. There's always something in our lives that gets in the way. If you look at it, you know, every Disney movie you start off with and there's a great little character and something happens bad usually to their family members and it's how do they survive, you know, or how do they thrive or what do they do after this. There's always something that gets in the way. And my question is, if we're the character in this story that tells God's story and our goal is to let our lives display the glory of God and, and there's a challenge or obstacle that comes up, Paul begged for his thorn in the flesh to go away. That was an obstacle in some way. For Jesus, he sat there in the garden, right? And he said, hey, Father, the cross, this big thing that you've asked me to do, is there a way that we, we can not do it? Is there a way that you could let this cup pass from me without drinking from it? There's, there's always a sense of we'd rather avoid the challenge or avoid the obstacle, but in every great story, every compelling story, Right? The character can't just go around the challenge or the obstacle. It's there. How do we, what do we do? And so then the, the last one is the, the resolution. How, do we, how does the character get by facing the challenge? How many of us in our lives have a challenge or obstacle? Does that define us? How we react to that? How we push over that? And, and here's the thing, sometimes we thought we had a big challenge until an actual big challenge comes along and makes all the other challenges seem small. And where we thought we were tired, 
right? We get to the big challenge, it's like, oh, I don't know what I'll do. And so we ended last week with the idea of God calling us to rest with him and, and forming that yoke and moving forward. I want to pick up the story again and keep talking about how our story is part of his story by using the, the, the life of um, Jacob in the Bible, still in the book of Genesis. But I was uh, reading, I did a, a, a sermon series in Genesis, it's probably 10 or 12 years ago. And I used to go and I used to read other people's messages and sermon series and all of this. And, and, and it was good because I got to see how other people viewed things. And I read a sermon series and, and it, was, it had an interesting title, but it was by Lee Eklov at the time. It was 12 or 13 weeks. And it was all on the story of Jacob in the, in the, New, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis. It's almost 20 chapters or 21 chapters of the book of Genesis is about Jacob. And he called it a messy, blessed life. And I thought, isn't it true that we as Christians live a blessed life? If we were to be honest, we live a great life. If you were to look at, yeah, we've got the challenge there, but, but outside of that, there's so many wonderful things. We go to a wonderful church, right? We have a wonderful family. We live in a wonderful community. We have a wonderful pastor. Every week I throw in something that in a Baptist church would get an amen, and y'all are just like laughing. Every week I throw in something. You should start looking for it. And, and y'all just let it by and you wave at it as it goes. That's fine, that's fine. But our lives are messy. Is there anybody who lives a perfect life? We think there are perfect lives out there. We look at Instagram and there are people taking the pictures and they have it all just right. And we think, oh, they have a perfect life. But if you go ask them if their life perfect, they'd say no. Right? Rich people, is their life perfect? They, they, we think they're perfect because they have more of something than we do, but if you ask the top ten wealthiest people in the world what they want, nine out of ten will say what? More money. So if we want more money, but they also want more money, are they any better off than we are? No, they just have more stuff to distract them. Right? They just have more toys. And so our life, we do, I think in many ways, are so well identified with the title of the sermon series, A Messy, Blessed Life. Because I think it's true that we can have both at the same time. And what I want to do is kind of say to, to us, as we're living that messy life, we can't always control the drama. We can't always control the, the obstacle and the challenges and the mess, right? And, and that bothers some of us to no end. We like to have everything in order. We like to have everything the way we can see it. We like to plan out into the future and know what's coming. We like to have all of these things that we can't, and we're just living in this kind of messy situation. We're living in the midst of, of broken relationships. We're, we're living in the midst of things that in some way, shape, or form used to be a little better, now aren't, or, or we think could be better but aren't, is that if we offer to God our messy, blessed life, right? And we say, God, I, you know, I know that there are things here that I wouldn't want to keep in here. I know there are things I would get rid of somehow you've, you've left in my life for some reason, right? But if we offer that to God, if, if the story of God is redemption, how is he going to use our story if there's nothing in it to redeem? If the story of God is redemption, right? But we want to offer God a perfect life. He can't tell his story because he's there to redeem. And if there's nothing that needs redeeming. So what if we offer to God our broken relationships, our broken finances, our broken life, our broken whatever habits, whatever it is, our broken personality traits, whatever it is that's not great. And we say, God, I want you to tell your story through this. What, what might he do? So I want to tell a little bit of the story of Jacob. I'm going to read a handful of verses at the beginning of his life and show you how messy it started off. I'm not going to read all 22 chapters. I'm not going to preach 13 sermons. I am going to read two passages from the end of his life where he's kind of counting down and it says how old he is and all those things. And we'll see if we can learn a few things about that messy life on the way there. In Genesis chapter 25... This is Isaac giving birth to Jacob and Esau. Isaac and, and uh, Rebecca. Rebecca's giving birth. Isaac's the dad. But he says, when, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. Exciting times. Babies are there. And the first one came out, red, all of his body like a hairy cloak. So they called him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. And there's a lot of symbolism. You go back and read the whole story. A lot of that fills in stories. But they said they called his name Jacob. And so Isaac was 60 years old when she was born with him. And then the next verses are, so these little boys are born. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter. 
man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents, and as if it, on, on cue to make sure we know how messy it is, it said Isaac loved Esau because he ate of the game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isn't that nice to go and tell us one parent loves one kid more and the other parent loves the other kid more? This is a story set up for success, right? Winner, winner. These are the perfect parents out there. We don't have to compete anymore. They won. <laughs> and, and this is the way that it shows us that Jacob is born into this family. He's born into a family where he doesn't meet dad's expectations. He's born into a family where he gets preference from, from one parent over another one. And then right after this, that's his, that's his childhood, right after this, we see what a, a grown-up Jacob and grown-up Esau do. This is the very next verse. One time Jacob was cooking stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. So he'd been out hunting. Even if he caught something, it's not ready to eat, right? And so Esau says to Jacob, let me have some of that red stew, for I'm exhausted. So they changed his name from Esau to Edom, became the Edomites, if you read through. After that, and there was constant, constant war between the Israelites and the Edomites, and it has uh, its basis right here. So Jacob said, sell me your birthright. To the oldest son went the birthright and the blessing of the father and all of this. It was something to be held in high esteem, and Esau did not. And so Esau says, I'm about to die. Of what good is it to use a birthright? What good, of what use is a birthright to me now? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. The blessing of the father, the, all the rights and privileges of being the firstborn son in that culture, which were humongous. And so Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went away. Thus Esau des despised his birthright. So why are we talking about Jacob? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. The nation of Israel was named after the younger son. All because Esau went hunting and came back hungry, right, and sold his birthright, sold all of the, the, the heritage that he was to inherit away for a piece of bread and some lentil stew. If I were to sell out, everything that I had for me, I might ask for a steak. I might not settle for some soup or stew, right? I mean, let's at least raise the bar here. How low do you have to go to give that away? And I've always thought maybe Esau was judged uh, harshly. Uh, Lee Eklov, who wrote that um, uh, great story, talks about Esau in, in this way. But he said uh, there, there's a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 or 16 that actually talks about Esau. And it said that he was that somebody is godless like Esau. It didn't say that he was hungry. It said that he was godless. And he said his failure was not that he was hungry or impetuous, right? But it was that he was godless. That, that, he, that doesn't mean that he didn't believe in God, but that God didn't matter to him. Having God's blessing on his life wasn't worth the price of a single meal. He just didn't care. And the takeaway for us is while it's true that the life God blesses may not be the life you choose, we need to have the faith and foresight to treasure the life that God blesses. He's saying that there's a choice here. One of their lives was to be blessed. It was already spoken about to Abraham. Usually it would be the oldest. Esau went hunting, right? And I can imagine if you've ever been hunting that you don't go out and five minutes later you catch what you were going to catch or shoot what you were going to shoot, or, or nab whatever it is that you were hunting for. Maybe it takes some time. And maybe if you had priorities right, when you got to the point where you knew, I'm at the end of my boat, you would let that go. But for Esau, right, catching the prize was more important than, than, than putting himself in a place where he would give up something more valuable because he was hungry. He made a choice. And I wonder when we're making choices, right? When we, the, the choices are laid out before us like that little girl, right? Do we honor the things of God and put ourselves in a place to make the right choice for God? Or do we put ourselves in such a horrible place that the worst possible decision is the easiest one to make at the time? And that happens sometimes. So, so there's a, a person who was reading a story about a, a chaplain who went to the Philippines. And in a lot of countries they celebrate Easter. It's a big deal and it's a big commercial holiday. In our area it's not a huge commercial holiday. People don't make stuff to sell for Easter, but in other places they do. And so they went into the city town square and there were big vendors out there and they were selling all the religious merchandise 
I had a college professor call it junk for Jesus, you know, the things that we buy and, and, and things like that. But it had all of the, the things and it was candles and incense and veils and rosaries and prayer books and jewelry and all of those things. And the chaplain was walking around looking at it. And again, obviously a big, big difference. You know, we celebrate Easter here indoors in a church, not necessarily out in the city streets, but it was a big deal. And one of the vendors had something. He was selling little crucifixes and he had a handful of those. And he had a sign out there, and his sign said, Cheap Crosses for Sale. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who ended up being killed by Hitler and his regime for, for standing up against him, wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And his point was, there are no cheap crosses. We can't get by serving Christ when Jesus says, Take up your cross and follow me. It's a big deal. Esau, it wasn't a big deal. And so what Jacob won that day was the blessing and the birthright to flow through him rather than Esau. Skip ahead a little bit because this shows you the power of the blessing to the end of the story. What happens in the middle of all of that, you remember Joseph and the multicolors and all of these kind of things, they're separated for a while. They end up in, in Egypt where there's a little bit more food because of the blessing of God. And so Joseph brings in Jacob, his father. They had been separated for a while. You can go back and read the whole story. If you're reading through the Bible, you're probably in that general area right now. But he stands before Pharaoh, and it said, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. If you were going somewhere, and you walked into the king, or saw the pope, or something like that, wouldn't you want a blessing? If somebody is there, and again, the, the, the fatherly figure passes on blessings to the younger... It's usually the prominent person offers a blessing to the not prominent person. But here you have Jacob, and he's not in a position. They've had to leave their land because of a, of a famine. They're in front of Pharaoh, who's in charge of the whole land. And it, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't jump out as much as us, to us as it should. But the whole idea that Jacob is blessing Pharaoh is a really interesting thing. And so Pharaoh says to Jacob, how many of the days and years of your life... And Jacob said to the Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130. This is his description of his messy, blessed life. Few and evil have been the days and the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. Jacob's upset. He's, he's gotten some things wrong. It's been a messy battle. At the end of that, instead of dwelling on the mess, he is a little bit. What does it say in the next verse, verse 10? Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. I think the Bible is trying to draw our attention to something because Jacob does it not once, but twice. Where he is standing as the one who would bless, right? Not the one who would receive a blessing. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but in the very next statement we're going to read, uh, it, it's going to uh, show that, that Jacob, is blessed, Joseph, Jacob is blessing his sons and grandchildren and all that, that, that the one who is uh, at the top should be doing the blessing. But he's blessing. So, so the, the path of blessing from God, and I know we don't often think of blessing and cursing in the same way that they did in the New Testament. I mean, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if the nation of Israel was doing well, it was why? God was blessing them. There wasn't an alternative there. It wasn't, we have a great king. It wasn't, things are peaceful. If they were doing well, it was a blessing of God. If they were not doing well, why? God withdrew the blessing. We could call that a curse, <laughs> whether it's active or passive, but God would say, oh, no longer going to bless. You're doing things that I don't like. Uh, somebody said, uh, you know, a lot of churches are closing. And somebody said, well, why are the churches closing? And somebody said, well, if we look at the Old Testament, don't we know why some churches are closing? If a church is growing, God's blessing them. That's what the Bible teaches. But the church is dying, what? God said, oh, yeah, let's pull that back. And all of a sudden it goes down. We don't always see things in that line before. But in this time period, they did. So God has blessed Jacob enough that Jacob should go around blessing other people through him because God to Abraham said that was the way it was to be done. So we finish up a little bit. and It says, so Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt. And the best of all the land in the land of Ramses and, and Pharaoh had, as Pharaoh had commanded. So Pharaoh actually gives them a blessing even though Joseph is blessed, uh, Jacob is blessing them. 
And Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of the dependents. So Jacob's role in all of this was that when famine came, they lost everything. And the one son who, right, they got tired of because of the coat of many stories and all of these things, who left and got sold into slavery, right, did so well that he was able to provide for all of his family. The Bible is clear that Jacob's success in life wasn't Jacob's success in life. It was that the hand of God was guiding them through a messy, blessed situation of redemption that could tell the story of God. In the next chapter, uh, at the end of the life of a lot of these patriarchs, it says they came in and they blessed their sons and, the, and the, some of them the grandchildren. This is a story of such. Jacob is blessing the ones that have gone on before them. And I want to read that blessing because the blessing that, that Jacob prays over his um, grandsons in this story, and also his son is there, is a remarkable thing that talks about the story of God and the blessing of God and how God's story becomes our story. But here's what it is. Genesis chapter 48, 15, 16, uh, and maybe 17 on there. But he says it this way. The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. There's a history lesson there. The God who has been my shepherd all my life, this, to this, to, all my life long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. May he bless these boys. And in them let my name be carried on. In the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. It's interesting, and here's the four takeaways that I think I would take from, from not only this series and how it fits in, but also from the blessing of God, right? Is that like Jacob, we have to embrace the life that God will bless. Even if it's the messy life, the story, our story that would tell his story is not going to be a perfect story. There are going to be challenges and obstacles and things that come our way but we have to embrace the life God will bless. Like Jacob, I think we must remember the faithfulness of God. Like Jacob, I think we must remember God as our shepherd. The shepherd's role was to, to provide and protect and feed. And then like Jacob, I think we have to remember how God has protected us, the angel who has delivered us from evil. How well in our story... Number one, are we willing to let God have our messy, blessed life and tell his story through it? Right? Whether it's a story of everything like John Wesley said or nothing. To give me all or to give me nothing. To rank me with the highest or to rank me with the lowest. All of those things, John Wesley said, whatever, whatever it is you want, do with me according to your pleasure, right? Right? How well do we remember the faithfulness of God? Do we even attribute when we're doing well to God's faithfulness and blessing? David, perhaps better than anybody else, knew God as shepherd. Do we honor God as shepherd of our lives and His ability to feed and protect and provide for us? How, how well do we remember the protection of God? How much are we motivated to let our story help tell his story? Even when we don't understand it, even when we don't like that part of it. I think God's given us a choice. I don't think God's given us every choice. We have, we have the life that we're living. We are where we are. We're doing what we're doing. We, with those who are around us who are, there's so many things we can't choose. But within that, when obstacles come our way, do we just say, huh, God's telling his story. This should draw us closer to God. Or do we say, oh no, mm -mm. everything bad that comes our way, I'm going to put on that guy over there. He's not being a good enough God. My temptation is to read difficulty and trauma and all these things into why didn't God protect me? But I think so much of the time when God is leading us through our compelling story about him, he uses redeeming us to tell others about His redemption. He uses His grace toward us as a way to say that He is full of grace and mercy. I wonder how much we're just willing to stop and say, God, take my story, the story of my life, and use it to tell your story. I wonder if we could stand for a minute. And I wonder if we just go back one slide. 
How much are we willing to embrace the life that God will bless? If we have choices, and one is the life we wanted with everything perfect and all of that, I wonder if we'd just say, God, give me the one that you'll, you'll bless. Give me the one that you could tell your story through. If we were to pray to God right now, could we thank Him for His faithfulness? Would we, would we have uh, uh, opportunities, that uh, illustrations in our life of when God has been faithful to us that we could just roll off our tongue? Why do you follow God? He has been faithful by doing and count them off or do we just not remember the faithfulness of God? If somebody would ask who is God toward us, would, would we use the term shepherd? He's going to take us where we don't want to go, but he's going to feed us along the way. Or maybe there's examples of God's protection. There's so many times somebody comes up to me and they tell me something bad, and I think to myself, it could have been so much worse. I think God is protecting us. But at the end of the day, as Christians, the title even suggests that we are followers of Christ. Would we offer him our story to tell his? Let's bow our heads just for a second. Close our eyes. Father, you know the people that are in this room. You know our story. You know whether we're struggling or not. You know, we might be thriving at the moment. This message might not be the most appropriate for everybody, but for a lot of us, Lord, there are challenges and obstacles in our way. We seem like we just get, get by one and here comes another. And we thought we were almost going to be overwhelmed by the last waves and here comes a tsunami. Wherever we are in this place, could we just offer you our story to help tell your story? Yours is one of love and so if we let you tell your story with our story, it'll be full of love. And it's about provision and providing and so if we let you tell your story through our story, if we just offer this blessy mess life to you, It'll be blessed. We'll have enough. But if we say, God, we want our story to bring you glory, would you take it, God? Would you take our lives? Would you use our stories to tell your story so that the people who live around here would know that God is full of love because of how much you've loved us? And not just loved us, but loved through us. Not just because they see a blessing on us, but because we become like Abraham and bless other people through what you give to us. Bless through us, not just to us. Could you do something big here, God, so that the people in our community know about you? They might not read your story. They might only read our story. And if they only read our story, God, will there be enough information to know who you are? So love us and bless us, but not just to us but through us. Lord, we offer you our stories. We offer you our messy, blessed lives today. Use us and work through us so that your story of redemption is told in our community and in our church and in our families. We ask this humbly in the powerful name of Jesus who came to save sinners of whom we are chief. With those words of Paul, we end our prayer and we pray in the name of of Jesus Christ, a wonderful Savior, and all God's people said, we're dismissed.